Qatar, one of the richest nations per capita in the world. It's experienced a rapid development since oil and natural gas were discovered here in the early 1900s. Mega projects keep changing the Gulf nation's landscape. But the Qatari coastline and its desert are also the source of a different kind of natural wealth. And if left unprotected, Qatar's native species and those who use the tiny Gulf nation as a stopping point as part of their long migration could be endangered as a result of a loss of habitat. I'm Stephanie Decker in the waters off the Qatari coast. We are surrounded by whale sharks, the biggest fish in the world. Actually, it's going right underneath us. In this edition of Talk to Al Jazeera, we'll take you on a journey with us to Qatar's diverse wildlife. And we'll be joined by a marine environmentalist and also a conservationist. And we'll be discussing the impact that potential uncontrolled development could have on these uh, diverse wildlife species living here if unprotected. It all started a few months ago. We wanted to know more about the presence here of the dugong or sea cow. We have in the region the second largest group in the world. This is how we first met Dr. Mossen al Yafai, a marine environmentalist and professor from Qatar University, responsible for taking those beautiful drone images. And also Ismail al Sheikh from Exxon Mobile Research. They've been studying the dugongs and why they gather here in such large numbers. We have two types of seagrass here. Uh, it is halofilla uh, and halofilla. And so these are the uh, the only thing the dugong eats, right? Yes. Okay, so I mean it's important to protect it. Yeah, this is very important, you know. Without the seagrass, you will not find any dugong in the future. But the most important for us, how to protect it from the fishing net, how to protect it from uh, removing this food, which is mean the seagrass. Uh, a lot of seagrass area already removed during a lot of developments going on, and dredging and uh, maybe pollution. We were incredibly lucky to find the elusive herd on another day. It's amazing, really. It's, you can be close up to them, and uh, you can see this uh, gathering is really, it's, uh, it's a huge, I'm not sure about the number, but 500 plus. But it's a beautiful thing to see them that close. But the reality is that these animals are endangered. On a deserted beach in the north of Qatar, a hint at why their numbers are decreasing. Ninety-five percent of the mortality of the dog on here in Qatar, it came, it came by catch. By catch, that means it is attached to the fishing net. And they need to breathe with the, within five minutes to six minutes. Uh, if they are under stress, they will die, you know? Wow. Yeah. Okay. And because of that, you will not see any physical uh, evidence. Uh, you know, how do you stop this from happening? Stop this uh, just to protect their uh, feeding area where is the seagrass and just uh, to inform the people, they are like uh, marine mammals. They are under uh, uh, endangered species. We should protect them. We should uh, do something. The survival of our planet's natural treasures depends on the protection of wildlife, of habitats, of entire ecosystems. Just an hour north of Qatar's capital, Doha, we continue our journey with the professor to find a landscape many would be surprised is here in the Gulf. A lot of fish spawn here, crabs, bears, and this mangroves really is protecting our coastal area from erosion. So really it's benefit to the, to the country. These trees have like hundreds of roots, and these roots, if you look in there, they are breathing from, the trees breathe from these roots. Oh wow, so they breathe through all of these. Exactly, and they are really, if you ever benefit, you can th think about it, when the high tide is coming, Small fish, they go and hide between these roots. Oh, from predators? Exactly, because the big fish cannot go swim the claws. 
It's beautiful to see everything in symphony. You know, birds, insects, crabs, fish, everything there is. We return at high tide to see the difference. So it's completely different at high tide. Huh? Sure, yeah. This is where the big fish coming now to feed. And so there's a lot of development that is happening here. How concerned are you about the impact that that's going to have uh, on the mangroves on a place like this? See, uh, since I started my uh, career in the marine science, this area really is still protected, and this is really very good sign. Uh, only I'm, you know, thinking about the future. If there is something is happening and they need to use this area for reason or other, this is going to be, you know, uh, disappear from the from our map. And next generation coming, they will see nothing. And this is my only concern now. And what kind of an impact does pollution have on the mangroves? It's only the human impact, what the people really leave when they are leaving the, the area, like plastic, something. They, maybe you can see there is one plastic bag that's already there. It can be really hurting the, the mangrove. It's twisted all around the branch. My hope is this plastic will be just abandoned in this country. It's possible. You know, so many countries, they stop it because this is killing really a lot of uh, even land animals like camels. I see a lot of people just throwing things out of their car. There seems to be a bit of a lack of awareness. It's really difficult. We try hard, really, but now these days is better comparing to the previous time. But if we stop the plastic, we're going to really do a good job to protect the environment also. On the northern tip of Qatar, a small taste of just how enormous the world's plastic problem is. Jose Saucedo heads a group that organizes beach cleanups and urges the community to get involved. Well, everything that you see here is being washed off from the ocean. But whenever I say that, you know, I want to be sure that we don't create a misconception that it's, oh, it's washed up, it's someone else's trash, it's not our trash. It is our trash. You know, 80% of the plastic that is found in the ocean comes from land sources. So that plastic bottle that you and I just threw away, whatever we were at the corniche, on the park, at a sports event, it's going to find its way to the beach, and eventually the ocean is going to dump it back on the beach if that didn't sink to the bottom of the ocean. The scale of it, how bad, because this, I mean, it's just littered everywhere. There's plastic everywhere. Well, just to give you a little bit of uh, scale and understanding, in this beach, uh, we've done, in the last year, we did 14 cleanups. We had 1,600 volunteers that came on all those cleanups, and we collected 20 tons of trash in 14 cleanups. The biggest cleanup on record that we've done was in May of last year during Ramadan. We had 300 volunteers. In one hour, we collected five tons of trash in probably two or 300 meters of beach. So show me a little bit about what you find because you can see light bulb, loads of plastic bottles, deodorant. Uh, absolutely, so if you don't mind, what we can do is we can grab a, a bag very quickly and just emulate what we do in our cleanups. Uh, so you guys can see how quickly we fill up a bag. So I think by now you get the point, right? Yeah. We spent four or five minutes, maybe. We filled up a bag each. Each bag is around 12 kilos. Uh, so you can do the math. And if... we've literally been in a tiny... Yeah. We haven't moved. We haven't yeah. moved. I mean, we, 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 we rotated even, a little bit. And we haven't even really started to clean it. So even. when we bring 100 volunteers, 300 volunteers, you can see how we can just cover a lot of ground and end up with 450 of these bags in one hour. So that tells you the magnitude of the problem that we face. The corona pandemic means there have been less of us out and about, less of us traveling.
we took a boat off Qatar's northern coast with Dr. Mussin to gauge the impact. Have you observed a change in nature due to corona and less people on the water, less people out? Definitely, sure. Not just in the, in everywhere, even the, the vision. You can see a clear sky everywhere. The water become more clear, more fish coming close to the area. And uh, that's tell us one thing, where is the human, where is the disaster? You know? Nature seems to be doing very well without us, right? 100%. If you leave something alone, anything, even if it's damaged, it will recover, especially in the environment. But if more brush are coming, sure, we're going to lose. This area is also rich in bird life. Thousands of cormorants who've been feeding all around Qatar throughout the day and now as, as the sun is setting, coming back to where they spend the night. And it's incredible to see they're just flying over our heads, thousands and thousands of them. Birds are Hamad al Khalafi's passion. I've been watching birds for more than 15 years and I was a hunter so when I started uh, photographing birds so I decided to stop hunting these birds because actually they show me something I, I wasn't seeing before. We have spotted like more than 350 birds in Qatar so it's a good thing. Qatar it's like a station for these birds while they are migrating from a place to other. But to get the shot, patience and blending in are key. And how does it feel when you get that perfect shot that you've been waiting for, for so long? Like, not, forget hours, right? Days, years, sometimes. Exactly. Even. Sometimes when you are uh, focusing on like rare birds and you want to get a very nice shot, it will take like a week sometimes. Like the Kingfisher. I spend like uh, around three weeks just to take one shot while he's uh, diving in the water to take the fish and coming out. The Ministry of the Environment has put laws in place that protect some of these birds during their breeding season. The hunting season runs September to March, and outside of that, it is illegal to hunt, we're told. You hunt. You also appreciate nature and understand the need to protect it. How do you balance that? How, how can you find a balance between those two things? Well, actually, it's hard to balance between these two because, like, we are hunters and we belong to uh, traditional people. We used to hunt also like our parents. It's a traditional thing uh, to us. So when you come and you uh, tell them, please don't hunt these birds, it will be like a challenge and you need to fight uh, for protecting uh, these birds. Maybe it will change in about five or ten years later. I hope so. Then, just as we finished our interview... I think we're good. Yep. Yes? Okay. okay. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> a little light relief. A wind gust frees us from the unbearable heated greenhouse effect of the tent. It's slightly cooler at dawn and our journey continues. We head south. This time we want to take a look at man's efforts to try to help nature because of what we have destroyed. Qatari environmental expert Mohammed Al Jada has been involved in the placing of artificial reefs along this coast. Ideally, we'd have natural reefs, right? Why? Why do we no longer have natural reefs? The first impact uh, we noticed in '96 uh, and '98, it's the heat wave that came and killed maybe 90% of the coastal reefs uh, or coral, I mean, and also you know in the sea. But there is also 
the increased navigational uh, movement in the Gulf, you know. The ministry put pressure on the oil industries not to use the, you know, seismic uh, search now. They use, you know, uh, wave, but this also affects mammals, you know. Uh, we put pressure on them to compensate. So the compensation uh, consists of, uh, you know, replacing coral reefs, sea seagrass, you know, or uh, programs to study marine life. So this is all compensation from the oil industry. So the reality here is that there is a lot of development, oil and gas, urbanization. How do you balance, that's a reality that isn't going to change, how do you balance that with preserving and conserving nature? The number one difficulty is the mentality, you know, mentality of people we deal with, you know, when we tell them what you're doing is, has an effect on the environment, they don't believe it. Oh, no, no, God created this and God will protect it, yes. But also God gave us the knowledge to do that, you know. So uh, once we go over this obstacle, sometimes we deal with, with good, uh, you know, uh, uh, people in charge. You know, they, they understand and actually they push into the environment. The balance is by compensation. That, otherwise, there is no other way to, to balance it, you know. Now, Qatar has some beautiful coastline, beautiful beaches, and despite it being the heat of summer, we've come here to the northeastern coast because we want to find out more about what's happening under the water. And to do that, we need to speak to a couple, a marine biologist and a captain who've been studying these waters uh, for almost 15 years. They're currently in France. We're going to give them a call. Hi, John. Hi, Cecile. Hi, Stephanie. So uh, we are just uh, northeast on one of the beaches. Tell me a little bit about the changes you've seen happening, particularly when it comes uh, to underneath the water since you first arrived. The coastline of Qatar has been developing really rapidly in the last 10 years, um, especially when it comes to south of Ras Lafan to the Inland Sea. All this coastline has been developing really quickly with the Pearl and Lucille and all this project on the coast. And that's a big parameter because uh, coastal de development is uh, actually um, affecting the habitat. The fishing has certainly had an impact. There's a lot more fishing now than there was and uh, the netting. You see a lot of nets now washed up on uh, structures and on beaches. Uh, we didn't used to have that in the old days but uh, that's how it's going at the moment. You also work with the oil and gas industry. I just want to get a sense of like, in terms of compensation, is there, are there laws in place uh, that try and compensate for what's being damaged or how, how is that working? The Ministry of Environment is actually quite strong in Qatar. I can, I can say from working in other places of the world, uh, especially in the Indian Ocean, that Qatar has got um, quite a good management for the marine environment with laws and uh, practice that are proved to be efficient. So, for example, when uh, an oil and gas company um, is uh, doing a new project that will uh, probably have an impact on the marine uh, environment, uh, the, the, they have to make an impact assessment and report to the MME and together with the Ministry of Environment they have to uh, put in place some strategy of mitigation and compensation. But going back to the reef installation and the, uh, we, we just did a recent one with 200 units which was five, six hundred tons almost of uh, reef. Three days after we put it there uh, we dived on it and there was fish living there already whereas before it was just a barren piece of ground. Three days later we had fish moving in. The um Arabian Gulf is a very special sea. Um, it's extreme. Uh, it can go to 15 degrees in the winter to 35 degrees in the summer. So there's like 20 degrees range of water temperature. And for corals, for example, this is completely insane. On the Great Barrier Reef, if the temperature uh, varies by two degrees above the normal, they start bleaching and, and suffering and eventually dying. In Qatar, the species we have, and they, they adapted to the harsh condition, so they, they, that's why we call them uh, super corals, because how can this coral survive in this kind of conditions where the rest of the corals in the planet die with a very smaller range of temperature? So it's really interesting scientifically that we have some species here in Qatar 
that can survive uh, the worst uh, temperature that we planning in 2100 uh, prediction of uh, seawater temperature in Australia. That's why it's worth protecting them as well because they, 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 they might be the future of, of course, uh, elsewhere, you know. We head back out to sea for one of our final trips and it's the one I'm the most excited about. We are looking to find the world's biggest fish. This is incredible. They're everywhere. Everywhere. See how many there is? You see what's happening now? The, you know, the, the tuna now is, is uh, spawning, you know. So it's, it's a mating frenzy. So you find one female, and there's like three, four males around her. As soon as she ejects the eggs, they, you know, they eject also their sperm. And it's a big fight. The strong one which will, you know, uh, eject its sperm on the, on, on the biggest amount of uh, eggs, you know. Uh, and w what happens? This frenzy, the sound, it will, the, the, the sharks, they will detect it, you know, and they will gather. All the sharks in the area, they will gather, they will come to this spot. So close, so close. And then, you know, once the spawning stops, you will find hundreds of sharks. And they come and feed on the eggs. Yes. And how many, how many whale sharks do you usually observe in this area? Uh, normally, in, in one aggregation, uh, the biggest we, we recorded by a drone is uh, 350 with one shot, you know. But in our database, we have more than 600, you know. It's a world record, you know. And why do they aggregate in this area in particular? Uh, the main thing in this area is the temperature. The you see, if you go five or six kilometers out of this area, the water temperature is about between 32 to 34, average 32 degrees centigrade. In this area here, about 27, 28, you know, it's the best or the ideal temperature for fish to breed, you know. Uh -uh. So when they breed or spawn here, uh, the shark comes for the protein, you know. They come specifically for the fish egg, you know, the caviar, you know. A bucket list moment, as they say. Our first glimpse of these enormous, gentle giants It's hard to describe the feeling of swimming alongside them, watching them feed. Feeling like tiny, insignificant, yet privileged guests in their world. The sun sets on our journey through Qatar's natural wealth. Just minutes from the capital, Doha. What's incredible? Yes, I like it. And even my my computer screen uh, top, it's this bears mix, you know. Oh, really? It's amazing. I remember it every day. <laughs> what would you like to see done more? to protect wildlife. I mean, be honest, like what, what would you like to see done? What is your dream? There is two, one thing, keep everything as is it, don't touch it. This is the most important thing. Second, education for the new generation. Maybe the old people, they used to use this uh, bears or the turtle uh, eggs or whatever. To hunt you it's, mean? Yeah, it's culture, it's long time ago. That time is limitation of the food. But now it's, alhamdulillah, everything available. So with the kids' education and how to protect it, not driving your car over the nest, not coming to hunt this bird for other reasons, like other sports like falcon, whatever, we're going to protect it really. And inshallah, we are, we are doing well, handling it. It's the end of our wildlife travels. It spanned months. Many are not aware of just how rich this small desert country is when it comes to nature. Increased awareness, hopefully, will lead to more efforts to protect and conserve all these diverse spectacles of nature.
not just through government policies, but it's also down to us as individuals to do our part in protecting the land and the waters that we are privileged to share.